by training, but her interest in birds began with her introduction to mist netting songbirds in the black pine infested forests of her home province, New Brunswick. Since then, she's pursued seabird field research on remote stormy islands on both east and west coasts of Canada. Her education has included work with four songbirds, her Bachelor of Science at the University of New Brunswick, seabird physiology, her Master of Science at Simon Fraser University, and multi-colony seabird tracking, where she had her PhD at Memorial University of Newfoundland. She has worked as a research associate and consultant in the field of seabird ecology and conservation, Simon Fraser University, Environment Canada, British Columbia Conservation Federation, Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And in 2014, Laura joined Bird Studies Canada as the Atlantic Program Manager. She lives in Sackville and is supported in all things by her enthusiastic husband and two rigorous young children. So Laura, it's all yours. Thank you very much yeah, for coming. It's really funny to have an introduction written by yourself. <laughs> It would have been worse if I did it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just turn this on. I'm just going to look at this light here for a second. Okay. Okay, so does that help? Can you hear me? Okay. All right. Yep. Um, so um, thank you uh, for having me this evening. I'm really pleased to be here and pleased to meet the, the Bird Society. Um, I, uh, I'm meaning to come and visit you for a while, so this was a really great opportunity for me to come and, and say hello. Um, as uh, Dave said, I currently work with Bird Studies Canada um, in Sackville, and what I want to talk to you about today is mostly based on work that I did uh, with my graduate studies at Memorial University, so that's why this is here, um, uh, out of the, the research lab of uh, Bill Montevecchi at, at Memorial University. So I, I kind of feel like I'm here to visit you, but also to visit an old friend, because a lot of this work uh, came out of my thesis, and if any of you have ever written a thesis, you might feel a certain way about it. I, f I feel fondly about my thesis. I'm like, you know, this is kind of a nice uh, visit back in time, in a way. So, uh, just as an outline to keep us on track for tonight, I'm going to first just talk about the MERS and the MER family, just sort of briefly at the beginning. Um, then we're going to move to talking about um, limitations in our understanding of winter ecology, just in general, of seabirds. And then talk about, well, um, about seabird tracking as a solution to understanding uh, those, to, to filling in those knowledge gaps that we have around winter ecology. And then I'm going to move you uh, to some applications. So how do we use animal tracking to inform some conservation or management objectives? And in that section I'll also hopefully um, be able to talk a little bit about how my experience uh, so far can help me to inform my work at Bird Studies Canada and how we might start to think about seabird conservation in that organization as well. So, um, the MERS. The MERS are marvelous. This is uh, the MER colony at Funk Island, which is an incredible place. Um, these are all mostly common MERS that nest at Funk Island off the coast of Newfoundland. Um, and this is the, the world's largest colony of of common MERS, but it does have a few thick billed MERS as well. So, as a group, um, the common and thick billed MERS, this is common on the bottom, thick bill at the top, and uh, as suggested by their name, they're very differentiated uh, by their, almost only by their bill. <laughs> they look very similar. Um, they share a genus, so they're both in the genus Urea, um, so they're among the most closely related of. Uh, the species in their in their group. Um, they have what we call a circumpolar distribution. So this is uh, the North Pole. We're looking down at the top of the globe. Here's uh, Newfoundland over here, and uh, here we are over here in Nova Scotia. So we're looking up into the Labrador Sea here, around Greenland. So, um, and this is of course Alaska on this side. So what's shown in this map are colonies of thick-billed MERS, which are in blue, and colonies of 
common MERS, which are in red, and I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, that they do have a circumpolar distribution, and uh, in many cases, the two species overlap in distribution. So that means uh, they're, they're sharing uh, breeding colonies. Um, so that happens in a lot of their range, but it happens less uh, in the higher Arctic. So they feel MERS are more associated with those high Arctic um, habitats, and again, this is breeding colonies only, and common MERS are more associated with the lower, sort of uh, lower latitudes. Um, and of course, as you likely know, the MERS are restricted to the northern hemisphere. So. MERS are in the group that we call the Alcidae, so that's also known as the ox. So um, these are the two closely related um, alcids that I'll talk about. Um, also in this group on the Atlantic coast, on the Atlantic side, are razorbills and puffins. And we also have the beautiful black guillemot. And in winter, uh, depending on how northerly you, you are, we uh, also have occurrence of dove key um, in the wintertime. They're Arctic breeders. Um, and they come into our waters uh, during the fall and in the winter time. So this makes up the, the group of alcids that live in the Atlantic, uh, on the Atlantic coast. So all alcids are wing-propelled divers, which I think is pretty neat. So they swim underwater with their wings. Um, and their wings they hold when they're swimming, you can see they're held in a kind of a slightly bent position as opposed to stretched out for aerial flying. So they all do this, and this actually act gives them an advantage to accessing um, deeper in the water column than other seabirds which might be foraging in, the, in these waters. So this is their sort of strategy of getting an advantage for foraging. They forage um, on small forage fish like capelin, herring, um, uh, sand lance, and bring them, they both bring these fish back to their uh, colony to feed their chicks, their nestlings, and they eat them themselves. They also eat a variety of zooplankton, um, depending on which species it is. So this is, their, this is what they're diving deep in the water column to get. Something else that's interesting about the alcids is they all, almost exclusively all, uh, only rear one chick per year. Um, so, the neat thing about seabirds, as I said, or, or uh, the ox in particular, is that they all congregate in huge numbers in colonies uh, lining the coast of Atlantic Canada. Um, but what else is, is obvious if you get to go to some of these places is that it, it's not just flocks of single species. They all congregate together in various groups. There's, you know, we've got uh, razorbills and puffins breeding in a similar breeding colony. Um, Stickbills and common merch here located on the same breeding ledge. There's a razor bill sticking its head out uh, around the corner. Of course, we also have MERS and, uh, or other alphas breeding with species uh, in a completely different uh, group. There's the northern gannet. So this is obvious to you, of course. Seabirds congregate in colonies, but what I find interesting is to think about how do they all congregate in these massive colonies um, for a breeding season, for a summer, and they all have to make a living in the waters around that colony. So it's interesting to think about how they do that. So, of course, uh, a lot of us are interested in going to colonies and, and really investigating some of these questions. Well, how do they do that? And what else can we study? This, some of you might know Bill Montevecchi. This is Bill um, catching flying MERS as they get across the landscape with his net. He's an expert at this. Um, <laughs> Seabird colonies function really well as research labs. So they're all in one place, they come out of the ocean, they're congregated for the summertime in these places where you can access them and study them and learn so much about, about them. Um, the problem with this is that because seabirds are congregated on islands, it just so happens that the, the bulk of the research, the information we know about seabirds, uh, happens uh, around the colony. It happens uh, with questions to do about breeding ecology or colony-based research. So this is just a schematic. This is not actually a quantitative representation, but let's, ex let's, let's sort of think about how much research is out there on seabirds. 
And we can imagine that much of it, the bulk of it, has to do with colony-based research. There's not a lot known about what happens when they actually go out to sea. And of course, for a seabird itself, its lifetime is not spent in the colony. It spends a few months there, but the rest of the time it disappears out to sea. So really, in terms of proportion, we have a disproportionate amount of research that happens at the colony, which is just a small amount of time for the seabird, and they're really doing a lot of other things uh, during the rest of their life. So it's interesting to think about filling up that gap and really um, knowing about the full life cycle of the seabird in order to make um, inferences about what influences seabirds. So, I don't want to make you think we don't know anything about seabirds at sea. We do. Um, I want to show you this map that was um, it's a, a compiled map of all different seabird colonies and information we know. Um, this is uh, the number of seabird species distributed globally and the darker blue colors are showing you the greater number of species. I don't have a problem with this map, except that you notice something right away. What we know about seabirds is kind of restricted to the coastal region. Um, and that's just because that's where we see them. Uh, it's purely um, opportunistic that we are able to observe um, seabirds in their habitats in coastal areas. But when you think about it, birds are not likely restricting themselves to these coastal areas unless they're they might have a particular coastal-based ecology, but seabirds are probably distributing throughout the, the uh, oceanic region. So, um, the other thing we know about seabirds uh, at sea, it comes from at sea surveys. Um, so, let's say you're in a boat, you're doing transects across, um, across a marine region, and you count the seabirds that you see. So again, this is a great way to know about the distribution at sea, but it's restricted to where you can go in a boat. And for safety reasons, you're not going to go too far off the shelf um, as, a, as a surveyor. Um, so we're just restricted in our, in our amount of knowledge about those, about those birds. The other thing we know about birds with the way we track sort of origins of birds is through band recovery. So any of you who have ever banded a bird know you band it in one place and you hope to find out something about where it goes during the year by looking at band recovery. So in this case, this is not a seabird, I expect this is a goose with a band on its leg. It's been recovered by a hunter and so we will then know something about where this goose comes from and be able to make inferences about their movements throughout the year. This happens with seabirds as well. Some seabirds are hunted, some birds included. And of course, if there's any mortality and there's a band on a bird, it will be, it will be retrieved and you'll know something about where it's been. Um, the problem with this, of course, is that it depends on a human being there to see the band and recover it. And it also is marking um, a mortality event, not a, um, a sort of lifetime event. So this, all of this is leading me to my punchline, which is that if you put a tracking device on a bird, and let it do its thing, that bird is going to tell you about where it's traveling um, if, if you have a recording device to help you. So this is a track, I'll just blow that up. This is a track of a sooty shearwater that was banded um, and tagged um, in the southern South Pacific. And then it's really using a huge amount of, of the Pacific Ocean to travel uh, throughout the year. So this just really gives us a huge insight into the, the <coughs> influences on seabirds um, throughout their year. That's all one bird in one year? Um, I think it's multiple birds. Okay. Um, so I think each color is a different bird. And it's a full life. So it's, it's usually they do this figure eight migration, mostly. So, they'll, uh, so this is likely wintering grounds up here. And then they'll return uh, to the breeding colony in the next. Uh, in, during there, it would be the austral summer in this case. So there's pretty neat stuff uh, coming out of uh, tracking studies on seabirds because it's one of those places people are still excited about tracking because you can slap a tag on something and find out something brand new. There's not very many uh, areas of, of biology and ecology where it is kind of a brand new piece of information. Okay, so just to sort of summarize that, when you use tracking to fill that gap about winter ecology, um, it works well for seabirds because, again, they're accessible at breeding colonies. 
once a year they're there, you know where to get them, you can go and attach a tracking device to them, and then that device then reveals um, year-round patterns of marine habitat use in more remote offshore areas, and that really helps frame our understanding of seabird ecology and habitat use. Is this the type of tracking device that gives you real time, or, or do you have to recover the, uh, the tracking device? Uh, right now, I think I'm talking generally about any tracking device. That one you just saw was a satellite tag, so that will give you real time information that's uploaded directly uh, to a satellite and then transmitted. I'll talk about the other ones in a minute. Okay, so um, just to kind of step back a little bit, again, we're tracking seabirds to understand. Um, just general biology. Um, we can t talk about foraging. Um, we want to try and pull that information forward to be able to identify maybe important marine features or habitats and areas in the ocean. Um, this really helps us um, giving us insight into what influences on marine systems <laughs> there might be. Um, if you use seabirds as sort of sampling a marine system. Um, and then ultimately I would hope that we'd be able to use this information for some appropriate management and conservation um, actions. Okay, so just as an example of some of the neat things you can find out when you're tracking seabirds, this is, a, this is um, a two panels showing the foraging distribution of northern gannets from an island off the coast of Newfoundland in one year and in another year. So um, it's very different the foraging strategy is very different between the years and it's telling you likely that there is something um, different going on with the, the food sources for that uh, for those particular years. So you can learn about foraging behavior. Again, we've, we've talked about this already, but you can really get a better sense of what is the migration behavior, timing, location, um, and distribution of, of migrating birds. This happens to be a, an arctic tern migrating from the north to the South Pole and back again. Um, um, another thing that you can start to investigate are um, more physical features of the ocean. So you might want to be able to identify important or persistent features and areas. This doesn't matter where this is, but this you know it's kind of information you can get out of satellite um, um, imaging of sea, sea surface temperature, which these seabirds may be queuing in on to, to direct their own strategies at sea. Um, chlorophyll levels are another thing that um, are, is interesting to investigate in terms of what seabirds are telling us. Also, uh, throughout the ocean there are persistent marine features or other features that cause key foraging areas to, um, to occur and for sort of uh, foraging hotspots for seabirds to exploit. Another thing we hear about a lot is using seabirds to give us implications about what's happening in the marine system. So we talk a lot about changes in food webs, what are the seabirds <coughs> bringing back to the colony, and how might that tell us how seabirds are changing diets through time and what that might mean about food webs. Um, it's, it, it's helpful to know where they're going to get that food to help you understand changes in, in food webs, changes in environment in terms of uh, ocean temperatures or ice uh, ice conditions also impacting seabirds. Um, seabirds are often used um, to, to track or measure the intensity of pollution or pollution events such as sort of catastrophic oiling events or chronic oiling from shipping traffic. Um, and they're used as a measure of the, of the intensity of human impact on the ocean such as, um, uh, such as fishing. Again, the, the key is that um, if you don't know about where they're going uh, throughout their life cycle, you don't really know what risks seabirds are directly encountering at sea. Again, um, to fill this research or this knowledge gap, um, it's great to know during the winter, during the non-breeding season, where are they and how are they using that habitat. Um, Aside from these sort of ecological questions, um, this understanding of distribution can help us to look at habitat associations and modeling, again, to, to look at marine systems, pushing us towards an assessment of, of risk for seabirds and other uh, marine creatures, potentially, and to, uh, to inform our, our management planning or conservation objectives for seabirds and for the marine systems. So I'm just going to 
take a pause there and ask if you have questions before I go to step two.